Now I'd like you to hear a reading from Mark, the first chapter, verses 14 and 15. Listen now for the words about God. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and God's realm has come near. Change your mind and believe in the good news. These are the words of God for all of the people of God. Thanks be to God. I came to um, Texas because my daughter was going to have a baby. And um, when I got here, I thought I would be a chaplain. And um, I still have not been able to find a chaplain's job. If anybody knows of one, let me know. So I decided that I would teach some school and just fill in as a substitute. Well, when I got there, they loved me. It's okay to say that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they, I'm now teaching full-time special education. And um, I'm loving it and still, of course, you know, preaching in churches and I've enjoyed filling in. But anyway, in the sense of Lent, uh, one of the kids calls me up the other day and he looks at me and goes, hey, Mr. Mark, hey, Mr. Mark, you know, pulling on my shirt. He goes, do you want to tell you, I want to tell you something. I was addicted to the hokey pokey <laughs> and then I turned myself around. <laughs> that could be my sermon today and I could go sit down. <laughs> Forever I lived in Tennessee and then I lived in Florida. And what I learned during this time is that people from Tennessee go to the beach to Florida on vacation. And I found that people from Florida many times will go to the mountains of Tennessee. But I remember the first time that we were going from Tennessee to Florida and we were going to St. Augustine. Anyone ever been there? Oh, if you haven't, you should go. It is an absolute wonderful place full of history. So we're on the way to St. Augustine and we got our old blue minivan Dodge and we're driving along and all of a sudden I look up and there's a sign I think seems to me as big as a football field and it says, repent, and has this huge exclamation point on it. And I thought to myself, well, that doesn't make me feel good. And I thought about it, and I talked to my wife. I said, you know, I think the person that put that billboard up, I don't think they think they need to repent. They think I need to repent. And then I went back to my old Baptist days, which seems like so long ago, and I remembered going to a youth rally one time, and I, I saw these kids that had something on one sleeve, something on the other, and something on the back, and I, I couldn't make it up. So I went up, and I asked one of the girls, what does your shirt say? And it says, this says turn, and this says or burn. I said, what's the back say? And she turned around and she goes, repent. So I thought about it. And I thought that word, repentance, needs to be remythologized, reworked. It's got a damp, dark name that lives in the dungeon. So I questioned for years, and it led me to prayer and meditation and study. So today, here we are. Repent is a rich and beautiful word, folks but it was robbed from a stolen away. Latin Christianity, early Catholicism, they became mainly concerned with humanity's behavior. Your question today, who sinned? And the need for amending it. Of course, those in power were the ones worried about amending other people's power. And extremely awful, horrific, brutal methods were called for, and they didn't call it the Dark Ages for nothing, right? Now, I have heard a rumor as I was coming here that there's a stretching rack in the back for long-winded preachers. Is that true? <laughs> I hope not. The robbing of the word repentance came to fruition when the Latin Vulgate, a fourth century Latin translation of the Bible, they made a horrible faux pas, a colossal error, and they translated this Greek word metanoia, repentance, as to do penance, as a punishment undergone in token of penitence for sins. Of course, again, you need to repent. I'm the preacher. I don't need to. So thus, our billboard philosophy in Florida are remnants. Remnants of a dead language and to me a poisonous theology exasperated by revivalism and the get saved or you're going to burn theology. 
It's amazing to me that it's still rooted in so many Christian churches, isn't it? Repent. Your identity is sinner. So it's Lent. Let's talk about repent. I remember one of our parish parishioners uh, working in our office and she was volunteering and we were talking around the time of Lent and the word repent came up and she kind of went, and then I thought, how many of you have ever seen the Lion King? Anybody? You remember when they said Mufasa and all those things would go, repentance does not mean penance. I like how Joseph Chilton Pierce says in his book, The Crack in the Cosmic Egg, repentance, metanoia, is a Greek word to change your mind. Can y'all say that with me? Change your mind. It simply can mean this, to just turn around. A fundamental transformation of the mind in which concepts are reorganized. And this change shapes the mind of the seeker. And I think this is a power source of the gospel. Repentance is to be seized by an idea of infinite possibilities, an idea that orients us as a church, as a human being, around a single point of unlimited possibilities. My brother-in-law, Keith, and I used to go golfing all the time, every Friday. That's where we met. Now, Keith was younger, and he thought he was really cool, and he had his really cool car and his really cool clothes, and so he's driving up to the golf place, and of course, since he's so cool, he's always got to be 10 minutes late, right? (laughs) And he's on his way there, and he's in his little Mazda RX-7, and he drives around the corner, and I just hear this bass thumbing, and I hear this song screaming, and the song is by a group called Finger Eleven. Everyone knows that group, right? And it goes like this. If I gave it all... If I gave it all away for one thing, wouldn't that be something? And the song just is screaming it loud all over the golf course. If I gave it all away, if I gave it all away just for one thing, wouldn't that be something? So he comes out, he's got his Nike hat, his sunglasses, everything's classic in his golf suit. And he comes up to me, and he's got his head down, and he looks at me. And he says, I just, he's southern, this could be, I just can't do it. I said, what can't you do, Keith? And he says, I just can't do it. I said, what is it? He goes, I can't give it all away for that one thing. And I knew what he was talking about because we are both people of faith. You see, when we come in here today, we proclaim. We proclaim that we accept this story, even it's all its mystery, that Jesus is our way. And that is the one thing. Oddly, I'm going to say something you may not have heard before. I believe Jesus had a change of mind too, involving water, his baptism, wilderness, fighting off the darkness, and his willingness to change, leaving everything behind to the image. So listen, because this is cool, I think. It looks like this. Put yourself in this. We come to the waters of our current and ancestral past, carrying all those stories that made us us, that made you you. And everyone in here knows that can get heavy sometimes, can't it? And in those times, we humans seem highly trained to focus on the mustn'ts, wondering who sinned, it must have been me because I'm a sinner, rather than endless possibilities. It's kind of like the first part of Shel Silverstein's poem. Listen to the mustn'ts, child, listen to the don'ts, listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles and won'ts, listen to the never have. But yet, with great courage, somewhere, somehow, your desire to turn around of the mustn't's reality led you to the healing water. And seeking a new reality, you went under and you rose up, bursting forth with endless possibilities. And the hope arrives on you in the form of peace, a dove. But you know the story. Immediately, you're driven back to fear. This beauty cannot be real. And the darkness drives you into the wilderness. And now in the wilderness, all alone in the desert, you must face your demons as the muscles fight to obtain their supremacy. The journey deepens as we're stuck in our sin 
And my acronym for sin is this, self-inflicted nonsense. Ego-centered world. Our reality is split in half and the darkness hearkens to us to listen to the lies that whisper you're worthless. And now in the wilderness, our world is split in two. The second part of metanoia, repent, is noia, used in the word paranoia. And now we're caught between two worlds. The out there fear left to our own devices or the in here, the heart, the way of Christ as our center. Psychiatrist Carl Jung would say this becomes an enormous contradiction, splitting our reality in half. The inner conflict is reflected outwardly and we are at the fate of the world. It is here choices must be made, but the story lets us know if we willingly, if we willingly resist the voice of the whisper, angels will entertain us. And overcoming the wilderness leads to the good news. I was talking with Mr. Case this morning as he came up here and I told him these are the favorite words you could ever hear a pastor say. In conclusion. <laughs> and now repentance no longer causes us to shudder with fear. With more courage and discipline, we make the one thing our thing, the way of Christ. It is our hub. It is our center. Imagine, if you would, a circle. And out here is everything that you've ever done, all of your life experiences. And in the middle of that hub is Christ, the way. And you do, you go up here and you draw from these experiences, don't you? And you relate to the whole world from the time you were a child till the time you're an adult. And what we forget to do is we react just without thinking from these experiences rather than drawing from the center. I've developed a whole neuroscience program with my daughter with Christ as the center and this hub and the triangle as the trinity where we come back from out here, you know, instead of relating from just some negative experience or experience and we come before we think and we draw from that center, that hub of Christ and so we know that God is out here and God is in here and God is everywhere in between because God is always working. God is in our going out. God is in our coming in. So we practice and we feed our new mind and we live risen to life and we continue to face down the darkness as we share the good news and we live this journey together. Remembering in this present darkness, we, like the writer of Mark, know the end of the story. Right now, aren't we Easter people going through an Easter tradition of Lent? This time where we look at ourselves, where we grasp, where we think, where do we need to grow? Where do we need to change? Where do we need to renew our mind? Where do we need to turn around? But through this whole story, we know the end, don't we? That death leads to what, folks? Resurrection. I'd like to finish reading Chill. Selverstein's poem again, this time with the ending. Listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never has and listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. <laughs>